In this video, I want to give you a quick rundown of the Cascade user interface. Now, Cascade can be accessed by double-clicking on any particle system in the content browser. Its interface is broken up into some just some basic key areas. We have a menu bar across the top, followed by a toolbar with a lot of our common functions. We have the preview window, which allows us to see what our particle system actually looks like, and this is navigable like a 3D viewport. Now to the right of this, we have our emitter list. This allows us to create and control various emitters to add to our particle system. Remember that a particle system is rarely ever going to be a single emitter. In uh, a lot of cases, if you have a really intricate effect, it's because you have several different emitters all working in concert. You can also create the modules that power the emitters here and select and adjust and even swap out these modules all right here inside the emitter list. Now down from here to the left, we have the properties window. As we select different modules, you'll notice that this will update. As we select individual emitters, we get the properties for that emitter. And if we deselect everything, we get the properties of the particle system itself. To the right, we have the curve editor, which shows us a graphical representation of any properties that are controlled over time. And we can edit the keyframes for those, as well as the interpolation curves and change our overall result. Now let's give a quick rundown of the functionality. Under the edit menu, we have the ability to save the package and regenerate the lowest LOD. I'll talk about LODs here in just a moment. Underneath view, we can control the visibility of several different aspects in our viewport, such as the origin axes, the number of particles coming out of any given emitter, and so on. If we go all the way down, we can uh, use a set motion radius, which I'll talk about the actual motion of this in a moment. Let me just set this to 150 for the time being, which is going to be its default value. You can save the camera position if you need to uh, store a particular location in your preview window that you like. Now under window, all, we, all we're really doing here is showing and hiding some of these different panels I pointed out. So if you don't want to see the properties window, you can turn it off. If you don't want to see the curve editor, you can turn that off too and just have the emitter list in the preview window. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn those back on. Now let's move down to the toolbar. First two buttons are restart sim and restart in level. Restart sim is just going to restart the simulation of your particle system. Notice as I click on it that our fire kind of starts over and the smoke starts emitting again. If you need that to happen in a particle system that's already been placed in your level, then you would click on restart in level. Next, we have find in content browser. If you click on this, it's going to select your current particle system in the content browser, so it'll be easier to place inside of a level. Next, we have save thumbnail image. Inside the content browser, every particle system has its very own thumbnail, and if you ever get that kind of no image icon, it's a good idea to jump in here and just click on the button to save out a new thumbnail. We can toggle orbit mode. Now this is going to be on by default, and it's really only useful if your particle system employs an orbit module. But currently we're not, so uh, we're not really going to see much of a result. We can toggle motion, and that's going to make our particle system run around in a circle if we want to see what this thing looks like while it's moving. And it looks pretty good while it's moving. We can change the view mode. So if we just left click on this, we're just cycling through different view modes. If you'd like more direct control, you can right click and choose the one you want to use. So we'll go ahead and leave this at lit for now. We can toggle bounds. Actually, let's not right click on that. If you left click on it first, you'll get bounds that just kind of flicker. And these bounds are constantly updating to completely encompass all of your particles. You see a sphere and a box. If you right click, you can set fixed bounds that don't move. So if you don't like that flickering effect, you can turn that off. Next, we have toggle post process. Right click on this and you can choose different post process effects to activate. For instance, now let's get close to our little fire again. We can turn on depth of field and see how that would look on our particles, just as an example. Now down from here we have toggle grid. This gives you a three dimensional grid, which not only can help you locate where you are in 3D space, but in this case also shows that we've got a little bit of a shimmer effect for our heat, which is pretty much invisible under a black background. We have play and pause. These do exactly what you think they do. Uh, play will keep the simulation playing, pause will stop it. We can also set the sim speed. Now you can left click on this button and cycle through various simulation speeds, or you can right click and choose the one you want to use. So here's our fire at 25%. And we'll go ahead and set that back up to 100. We can toggle the loop system. If you have a particle system that 
does one thing over and over again, like let's say an explosion, which is just going to go blam and then it's over. If you leave toggle loop system on, it'll just keep on exploding. So you can see what it looks like each time. If you only want to see it once, then turn your toggle loop system off. Now, this particular particle system doesn't loop. It just goes on forever. So we won't see any result here. Toggle real time gives you real time results in your viewport. If we turn this off, our particle system will quit moving unless we're moving the mouse or causing other uh, updates. So we'll go ahead and leave that on. We can change the background color of our particle system window, our preview window. And sometimes you'll probably find yourself wanting to do this just to lighten up the background. Like if you have a, a particular effect and you want to see like maybe how much smoke billows in a lit room, then you can increase the color. And you can use any color of the rainbow, though generally I find myself using black and shades of gray. Now continuing on, we can toggle a wireframe sphere. If you click on this, it's going to ask you for a radius. Click OK, and here you go. It's just a wireframe sphere, which can be really good to help you get an idea of the overall scale of your particle system. We have undo and redo. These are fairly self-explanatory. And then we have our LOD controls. Now they start with jump to highest LOD, then jump to higher, add LOD before current, add LOD after current, jump to lower LOD, and jump to lowest LOD. So it would probably help if we had some idea of what LODs are. LOD is short for level of detail. You may have heard the term before. And what it refers to is an internal system for your particles that allow them to get simpler as you move away from them. And here's an example. Currently, our particle system has two levels of detail. We can go to edit and choose regenerate lowest LOD, or over here inside the toolbar, we can click regenerate lowest LOD. We will get a warning, but that's okay. We haven't really done anything special, so it's okay for it to erase anything we've done before. Now, you see we have two total LODs here in the window. If I click on jump to lower LOD, here's what my particle system suddenly looks like. A much simpler version of my flame. Also notice that many of my modules get grayed out. This is because they've been locked into a low setting. If we want to be able to change these, then we need to right click and actually set these up so that we can, uh, we can alter their, their settings. What I'm going to do though is set inside my spawn module here with our flame. And we can take our rate. Now our rate is currently set to 3.5. If we switch back over to our higher LOD, you'll notice it jumps up to 35. So you can see the relationship between the two. Now if that's unacceptable, like let's just say here at our low LOD, a spawn rate of 3.5 is just not acceptable. It's too low. We can crank this up to a constant of 10 and start to get a little more flame. But what you're talking here is what do you want the flame to look like when you're really, really far away from it? Now, you see me moving around a lot here inside the uh, preview window. I'm navigating this such that if I drag with left mouse, let me go ahead and switch back up to my higher LOD. Uh, left mouse allows me to rotate around. Right mouse allows me to zoom in and out. And middle mouse allows me to pan the camera. So as we switch to these lower LODs, these textured modules are locked out and are not really being calculated anymore. So if we want to, we can right click on them. And we can duplicate the next higher LOD. So if we grab, if we do this, say in this case, now let's find something that would maybe be a little more apparent, uh, such as, ooh, maybe on our smoke. So here we are with our low LOD. I'm trying to find something that would be really obvious. And there's not much here because this is a really simple particle system. That's okay. Let's just grab our color over life and we'll duplicate the next higher LOD. And you'll notice that gets rid of the texture. And now we can edit this value. We're no longer locked out of it. Now, that does mean that at this LOD, this particular module is requiring more calculations. So you want to do this as little as possible. Because in the end, the whole idea of level of detail is to simplify your particle system as you move away from it. So that's just a quick walkthrough of LODs. Now, over here are our last few buttons. We can regenerate the lowest LOD. We can regenerate the highest LOD. And we can delete any extra LODs that we add. Now, as I mentioned, this allows us to change our detail as we move closer or further away from something. Currently, I have two levels of detail. If I deselect any of my modules and I jump down to the properties window, we're now looking at the properties for the particle system as a whole. And there's an LOD section here, which includes LOD distances. Notice that we have two LOD distances and we have two LODs. Our first LOD starts at zero, starts right at the location of our particle system. 
The next one begins 2,500 units away. So if we switch over to LOD2 and we get this simple flame, this is what we can expect to see if we were 2,500 units away. If we wanted that to happen while we were closer, all we'd have to do is change this value. We could pull this to any value we want. For instance, if we set this to 512 units, then our particle system would look like this if we were 512 units away. And that's how you can control when the LODs actually make their switch. So let's set this back over to 2500. Now overall, that's a look at the bulk of our user interface. So you've seen the, the toolbar, some stuff about the menu bar. We've taken a look at the preview window and how to navigate it. The the emitter list, I mean, the easiest way to talk about this, aside from you're going to be adding all of your modules really by right-clicking and choosing them from these sub-menus, really the best way to learn this, though, is to get in and start using it, which we're going to start off in the next video actually building the fire effect that you see here. So let's go ahead and get started with just this uh, quick primer to the Cascade interface in place. Let's go ahead and start building our fire particle effect. Before we get started actually putting together our particle system, I want to take just a moment and show you the assets that we're going to be using to build it. I'm going to open up the content browser and currently I'm inside the particle demo package that I've put together. This has a few textures and a few materials. Here's the first texture. It is just a picture of four pieces of fire. It's divided into a two by two grid. Pretty easy. Next we have the smoke texture which is a similar thing, it's just with four puffs of smoke, and we'll be using each one of these puffs individually in our particles. Now let's take a second and look at the materials as well. First we'll start with M underscore fire, which will be the material we'll use for the flames. And let me show this actually on a plane, because it'll just be a little easier to understand what it is you're looking at. First off, notice that the actual material node is set to a blend mode of additive, a lighting model of unlit, and if we scroll down, you'll notice that used with particle sprites and used with particle sub UV have both been activated. Now, as for the nodes that are plugged into it, we have a particle sub UV that is actually attached to our fire 2x2 two two texture. And we have a vertex color. We're taking the RGB info of both and multiplying them together. We're taking the alpha info of both and multiplying them together. The RGB goes into emissive. The alpha goes into opacity. Very straightforward. Now if we jump over to the fire glow, we actually have the exact same network and the exact same settings. We've just swapped out and we're now using the smoke texture. If we come down and take a look at the smoke material, we have some different settings. We're using a blend mode of translucent and a lighting model of unlit. However, we have still made sure to check the used with particle sprites and used with particle sub UV settings. Outside of that, it's exactly like the glow setup. So we have a particle sub UV that is linked over to our smoke texture, and the color is multiplied with a vertex color, and the alpha is multiplied with a vertex color. Color goes into emissive, and the alpha goes into opacity. Now, let's take a look at the last material. This is a heat shimmer material. And this can be a little bit hard to see what's going on. So what I'm going to do is grab one of the settings over here, this little constant value, and crank it way up to like 100. And if you take a look over here in the preview window, you can really see the result now, how it's distorting the background. Now, what we've got is two textures. We have our parameter sub UV, which we saw earlier. It's just our little smoke texture. We also have a texture sample, which is coming from one of the uh, textures that is included with UDK, being TEFX Particles Distortion 01 underscore D. Now that's plugged into a panner, which is moving the texture around. That's all it's doing. It's sliding it up and slightly to the left. So there's the speed X and speed Y settings. That is being multiplied by a factor to control how much distortion we have. And then the two results, the texture and that multiply, are multiplied together to feed our distortion. The RGB information is also being used for opacity. You could use alpha just as well in this case. Now I'm going to turn my little constant here back down to 10, and that's going to set my distortion back to its default settings. I only cranked it up so it would be a little easier to see here in the preview window. 
Now, I don't want to save any changes here. Now, that is just a quick overview of the assets that I have on hand. Now, uh, if you have this package, you can open it up. Great. If you'd like to build the materials on your own just for the uh, experience, cool. If you want to just watch me go ahead and build the fire system, that's what we're going to be doing in the next video. I'll see you there. Let's get started constructing our particle system. In this video, we're just going to be constructing the base particle system itself and adding our first emitter and changing just a few settings. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to right click here inside the content browser and choose new particle system and it'll ask for some information including the group and asset name. So let's give this a group of particles and name of PS Fire. Now that will show in the content browser and it's also going to open up inside Cascade, which is currently minimized back here in the background. So let me go ahead and enlarge that. Now currently, Cascade is completely blank. There are no emitters. There's nothing in this particle system just yet. I'm going to minimize Cascade away for just a moment. Back here in the content browser, I'm going to select materials and make sure that I have M underscore fire selected. Then we'll re-expand Cascade. And then here inside the emitter list, which is this great big black area that you see, right click and choose new particle sprite emitter. By having that material selected beforehand, you'll notice that it is automatically applied to the particles of our system. Now, I just zoomed in on that. I did that just by dragging with the right mouse button. The controls in here are drag with the left mouse button to tumble around, middle mouse to pan the view, and right click to zoom, just as a quick reminder. Okay, now starting at the top, we're going to be changing some of our module values within this emitter. I'm going to start with the required module. Make sure that your screen alignment is set to PSA square. That's going to keep all of our particles, uh, sprites, perfectly square. They're not going to stretch out or become rectangular. Down underneath sub UV, we're going to set the interpolation method to PSUVIM random. Now, once we get this fully set up, that means we'll be choosing one of the four images of our material at random, but we need to establish the number of images in each dimension. So we're going to set sub images horizontal and vertical to two. Now you still won't see a random selection take place. That will actually come when we add a special module just for the purpose. Let's jump down under spawn. Now inside the properties for spawn, I'm going to expand rate. And underneath rate, you're going to see a distribution. Now at this point, we haven't really talked about distributions, but that's okay. We're just going to kind of go with them for now. I just want you to take note of the word and notice that underneath it, here we're looking at a distribution float constant. And if I expand that, it's just a single constant value, which currently I'm going to set to 35. Underneath we have the rate scale, which I'll expand. We also have another distribution float constant that's currently set to a scale of 1. We'll go ahead and leave that at its default. Now let's also set up the lifetime for these particles. So I'm going to jump down to the lifetime module in my emitter list. We'll expand lifetime, again the word distribution, this time a distribution float uniform. And this uniform gives us a min and a max value. So we can actually specify a random range. We're going to set these flames up to live between 0.375 seconds and 0.75 seconds. So now some of the little tiny flames live for longer than others. Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead and stop right here. I just want you to get to this point. So let's go ahead and close out of Unreal Cascade. And let's save our package. And that's going to wrap up this video. In the next video, I'm going to talk to you specifically about distributions. Now that you've seen a couple of them, so that you have an idea of what distributions are and how they work, especially with Cascade. Let's talk about distributions. Now, first off, what is a distribution? Really, a distribution is just a way to handle numbers. Now, there are five types of distribution available. There are constants, uniforms, constant curves, uniform curves, and parameters. Though you should note that all five of these distribution types exist for float and vector data types. So in the end, you'll have a float constant, a float uniform, a float constant curve, etc. Now let's go one by one through each of these. A constant, what is it? A constant distribution will provide a single number that does not change over time. So an example would be something like 13.7, which could be positive or negative. And for a vector, it would be a value for x, y, and z independently. A uniform distribution 
allows the user to specify a range of values. Each time the distribution is called, it provides a random number from within the range. An example for a float would be something like negative 30.055 up to 18.925. And for a vector, you can see we've got a minimum value for x, y, and z, and a maximum value for x, y, and z. And each time we called on that distribution, some number would be chosen from within that range. Now, it should be noted that in the case of a vector, a random number will be chosen independently for each of the three axes. Moving along, we have constant curves. Now, constant curve distributions are values plotted as points along a curve, which allow for a value to change over time. And it's important to note that the interpolation between these points can be edited in a Bezier tangent fashion. There's actually a curve editor inside the Cascade Particle Editor that we can use to edit these curves if we desire. And here are some visual examples. So you can see on the left we have a float value, which is a single number graphed between three points that slowly sweeps up. And then for the vector, we have three curves that are separated. Now, curves will not always be separated like this. They've just kind of been pulled apart for the case of an example. Sometimes they'll stack right on top of each other. Now, next we have a uniform curve, and this is a little more complex. Uniform curve distributions allow each point of a curve to be plotted within a min and max value. And as time progresses, a random value is going to be selected from within that range. Now here's what this would look like if graphed out. For a float, notice we have two curves, a min curve and a max curve, and the shaded area in between would be the random area from which a value would be called. Now an important thing to keep in mind is generally you would want to avoid using this distribution on anything that's going to be called on every single frame of animation because that means on every single frame you're going to get a brand new random value now granted it will be within a range so there's there are certainly some uses for this but generally speaking it'll cause a jitter and then over in the vector side you can see we have min and max curves for all three of the axes and you can see a little bit of overlap there Finally, we have parameters, and parameter distributions allow a value to be accessed and changed through Kismet or Matinee, and just a couple of examples, and these examples could really go in any direction that you can imagine. But for a float, we have a quick example of using Kismet to shorten the lifespan of a particle system, such as allowing the player to turn down the intensity of a gas flame, or with a vector, you could use Matinee to change the initial size of a particle system, such as increasing the spawn rate of sparks as an animated laser beam cuts through an object. Now that's just a quick look at all of the different distribution types. Now let's jump back over to UDK for just a moment. And I'm going to open up our PS Fire. And let's just grab, it doesn't really matter which one, so many properties have a distribution on them. I'll jump into our spawn module. And we'll take a look at the rate again. Now notice under rate we have a distribution. And we can change that distribution at any time. If you take a look right at the end of the word distribution, all the way across the property, there's a little tiny blue arrow button. It says create a new object, and this gives you access to all of the different uh, types of distributions that you can apply to this property. So you're not limited to just using a float constant. If we wanted, we could take the spawn rate and give it a min and max value by applying a uniform, and then we'd have a random variation. So that's a quick look at distributions. As we work through the various uh, modules for our particle system, we're going to be changing distributions a lot and setting their values. So now you know how they work, and that's going to wrap things up for this video. Now that you understand how distributions work, let's move on with our particle system. The next thing I'm going to do is jump down to our initial size module. Let's expand start size. And currently, this is set to a distribution of vector uniform, which will give us a min and max value for x, y, and z. Let's go ahead and expand both of these. It is kind of interesting to note, or at least important to note, that min and max are listed alphabetically. So the min is going to be at the bottom, the max is going to be at the top. And you shouldn't get the two confused. Now, currently, these are both set to 25. We'll go ahead and leave them at the defaults for now. But if you'd like to change the size of your flames when they're first born, this is where you're going to do it. Now, down from here, we have the initial velocity of our flames. Let's play with this a little bit. I'm going to take our start velocity and expand that. That's going to have a vector uniform by default, so let's expand min and max. We'll scroll down a little bit so we can see all these. For the minimum, we're going to set values of negative 20, negative 20, and 75. For the max, we're going to set values of positive 20, positive 20, and 125. So our flames are generally moving up, 
but they've got some left and right variation. That's essentially what we've just defined. Now, moving on from here, we've got a color over life module that's here by default. So let's take a look at this. I'll go ahead and expand color over life. Now, currently, its distribution is set to vector constant curve. What I'm going to do is replace that with just a regular vector constant. The material that we've set up already has the flame color that I want to use. So I'm going to come over to the distribution, click on the little blue arrow, and just choose distribution vector constant. And we're going to set the constant value to 1, 1, and 1. So we're just going to basically use that default color that's already applied in the material. Now down from here we have the alpha over life as well. So let's close up color over life. We'll expand alpha over life. This also has a distribution of float constant curve. And what alpha is going to do is allow us to make our particles fade out. Now they're already fading out just a little bit. If we expand the uh, float constant curve, we can take a look at its points. And it has two points. And it's important that you see how to read these. So let's go ahead and expand these out. You have two values on a curve point. You have an in value and you have an out value. The in value is the time along the life of the particle or the life of the emitter as it may be that the value takes place and the out value is literally what your value is. So in this case, we're starting off at the birth of our particle, which is time index zero, and we have an alpha value of one, which is completely opaque. Now take a look at our second point. We're saying at an out an in value of one, which is the end of our particle's life, we have an out value of zero, meaning we're fading out over time. So we start off at birth, fully opaque, we end up at death, fading away. And we can see that result in our preview window. What I'm gonna do is actually graph this out so we can see the result. Let me go ahead and just kind of pull this up a little bit. Over here on our color over life module in the emitter list, at the far end, there's a little tiny green icon that looks like a curve. If you click that, you can see the result over here inside the curve editor. And I'm going to scroll back on the mouse wheel to make it a little easier to see. And you can see how we're just dropping off in our opacity as time marches forward. We're going to change this a little bit. Let's start off by adding another point. So over here inside our points list in the properties, if you look all the way over on the right hand side, you'll see a little green arrow labeled add new item. Let's go ahead and click that, and now we have a third point. Now that's going to break our particle system. It's going to start to behave really strangely. And the reason is that our last point in the curve has an in value of zero, which is the birth of our particle system, or the birth of our particle, and it has an out value of zero too. So it's kind of like we're defining the birth twice. We're saying in the first point that at birth I want you to be full bright, and then in the third one we're saying at birth I want you to be dark, and it really starts to make things confused. But we'll set it up one point at a time. So come up to point zero, set the in value to zero, set the out value to zero as well. Let's come down to point one. We're going to set the in value to point two, or 20% of the particle's total lifespan, and the out value to one, or full bright. And now if we come all the way down to point two, we're going to set the in value to 1, or the death of the particle, and we'll leave the out value at 0. Now what we've just done is we've caused the particles at the base of our flame to now fade into existence over the first 20% of the particle's life. They no longer pop into view. And you can see that reflected here in our curve editor. We ramp up and we ramp back down. Now this is a really harsh curve. Uh, you may want to make this linear. We could select our second point here in the curve editor and switch over to, say, Curve Auto Clamped. And we could probably do the same here for the first one as well. So we click that and do Curve Auto. And now we have a nice flowing curvature. Though, granted, these particles are moving so quickly that the audience members wouldn't really be able to tell that linear change. So there's a quick look at setting up our color. Now, the last thing we're going to do in this video is set up our sub-image index, which will allow us to switch between our different pictures of flame that we have inside of our material. So I'm just going to right-click here inside the emitter list within our emitter. We'll come down to sub-UV, and I'll just add a sub-image index. And as soon as we add that, we immediately start to get a random variation of the different sub-images flickering through. Now, that's as far as I want to take things from here, so I'm going to go ahead and close Cascade for now. Let's make sure that we save our package, and that will wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. Moving on with our particle system, the next thing I want to do is make our particles spin a bit. So I'm going to right-click and come down to Rotation Rate, 
which means animated rotation, and we'll choose our initial rote rate module. Now, by default, this causes our particles to all spin clockwise, which looks a little bit funny. So let's select the initial rote rate, expand start rotation rate, and the distribution's a float uniform with a min and a max, so let's set min to negative one, and now the particles can spin either way they like, and already the result is starting to look a lot more like flame. Now next, I want to change the point in space from which these particles are spawned. Currently, they are all spawned from the exact same location, and it does look a little bit funny. The fire will look a bit more natural if we can spread that out. So what I'm going to do is right-click, come down to Location, and choose a Cylinder module. Now, if we select this and take a look in all of its properties, there are a lot of settings to control the, uh, the look of this cylinder and how it's placed, but if we scroll down... At the very bottom, you'll see Cascade 3D Draw Mode. Go ahead and switch this on, and you can visualize the cylinder itself, and you can kind of see how this works. The particles are all being born from random locations inside the cylinder, but we're going to simplify this down a little bit. Let's take the start radius. Currently, this is set to a float constant of 50. Let's pull that down to 5, so it'll be a lot smaller. And it's a little bit on the tall side, so let's come down to Start Height. And we're going to pull that down to 5 as well. So now our particles are, have a little bit of variation in the point at which they're born, which causes a little bit more of a flickering effect. When you're done, go ahead and switch off 3D draw mode for the cylinder so it's not a distraction. Okay, so next we're going to work on the size of our particles. And we're going to change the particle size throughout their lifespans. Basically, we're going to make the particles get smaller over time. Actually, technically, we're going to make them start off small and then get bigger and then get smaller again, if you really want to be technical. So let's right-click. We're going to come down to Size and choose Size by Life. This allows us to change the size of the particles across their lifespan using a curve. So we'll select that, take a look at the Life Multiplier property, and you'll see this already has a distribution vector constant curve. Now, if we expand this, we have two curve points by default, 0 and 1. And if we expand this, let's just expand our first point, you'll see we have an in value of 0, but the out value actually has to be expanded, and that's because out value has numbers for x, y, and z. However, when we first set up our emitter, you might recall that we had set our required module to have a screen alignment of PSA square. This means that our particles will always be square in shape. What that translates to is that when scaling our particles, we only have to change the x value, and y and z will update accordingly. And technically, we're not even using z because these are just uh, two-dimensional sprites. If we were creating a mesh emitter that was emitting little static meshes, uh, then we could use x and y and z independently. Okay, so let's jump down here to our settings. For point zero, we're going to leave the in value at zero. We're going to set the out value to zero as well. So now we have these tiny little particles that get bigger across their lifespan. Now let's close that up and jump down to point 1. For the next in value, we're going to go to point 2, which is 20% of the particle's total lifespan. And we're going to set the out value to 1.25, so 125%. So now you can see those particles growing over that first 25%. Now I'm going to add one more point, so up here in my points, I'll click plus, which will break my particle system for a moment, because by default, your in value is set to zero, which is the birth of the particle, and your out value is set to zero as well, so we're kind of overriding that first point. So let's take the in value and set it to one. The out value by default is zero, which will work fine. That just means our, our flames are going to billow outward, and then they're going to get smaller as they go up. So that takes care of our size over the life of the particles. The only thing is that if we take a look at this curve, if we send it over to the curve editor, and let's go ahead and I'm going to remove some of the uh, other objects from our curve editor. We can just uh, switch these off actually. Now let's view uh, everybody. So I'm just going to click view all. And in this case, we actually do kind of see that really harsh change in direction from the linear interpolation. So I'm going to fix that. By coming over here to our X curve, you see how it kind of jaggedly goes up and then back down? We'll select that first point down here inside the curve editor. I'll try to center it up to make it easier to see. And we'll go ahead and give this a tangent type of auto clamped. And I'll come up to the second point and do the same. 
So now that smooths things out, and you no longer see that kind of pointy billow, because it, it was getting kind of obvious that your particles were getting large and then immediately getting down with kind of a jerky style motion. So that fixes that problem. Now with that, our flame emitter, as simple as it is, is essentially done. So I'm going to go ahead and save my package. Let's go ahead and close out of Cascade. We'll select the particle demo and hit Control S, and that will wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. Continuing with the particle system, the next thing we're going to add is a brand new emitter whose only job is to add a little bit of glow to our flames. Now, it needs to have exactly the same behavior as our flames, which makes this pretty easy. What I'm going to do is select our flame emitter, and it'd probably be a good idea to name this emitter, especially because we're about to have another one. So I'm going to start off by selecting the emitter name, and let's change this to flame. Then I'm going to right click on the emitter. Under the emitter subcategory, we'll come down to duplicate emitter. And that makes a second copy of the same emitter. Now I'm going to select this duplicate. I'm going to come over to emitter name and set this to flame glow. Now here's how easy this is. All I'm going to do is come down to the required module. And here's the material that's currently applied. We will find this object in the content browser. I'm going to click on M underscore fire glow, close the content browser, and swap out for this new material. Now that gets us started. However, you'll notice there is a little bit of a problem in that the color of our glow is a little bit off. So we're going to change that by coming over to our color over life and let's expand the color over life category and currently I have this set to a distribution vector constant so let's expand that and we're gonna set the values to 2 for X which is the red channel 0.5 for Y which is the green channel and then 0.25 for Z which is the blue channel now that's actually pretty red maybe we should add to that let's try 0.7 for green there we go. It starts to yellow it up just a little bit. All right, so I'm changing values on the fly, but there we go. So I'm using, in the end, 0 0.2, 0 0.8, and 0.25, and you can play with whatever values you like to get a, a color that's pleasing to the eye. But really, that's all we need to do to add some extra glow to our flames. We've already got the material set up, and since it needs to behave in the same manner of, as our flames, it's just a matter of duplicating that emitter. Now next, I want to add some heat shimmer, and we already have a material set up for that as well. So let's just take the flame glow and we'll right click, go to emitter and choose duplicate emitter again. This time let's go ahead and rename it first thing. We'll call it heat shimmer. Go under the required module, take the material, we'll click find object in content browser. We'll click M underscore heat shimmer. Let's close that and use our new material. Now, however, it's going to be a little bit tricky to see what this material is doing in a perfectly black viewport. So what I'm going to do is turn on the grid by clicking the toggle grid button in Cascade's toolbar. And currently, you're not seeing any result. And it's just because we don't really have much by way of particles and these aren't living for very long. Though it's also a good idea to close Cascade when you do this and reopen it. So let's go ahead and do that. And now I'm seeing just a little bit of distortion in there. It's, it's not much, but it is there. So we can change this in a couple of different ways. The first thing I'm going to try is increasing the lifetime of these heat shimmer particles. So they're starting off with the same as our flames, which is 0.375 to 0.75. I'm going to change that to min of one second and maximum of 1.5 seconds. And that gives us a lot more distortion. You can start to see that actually inside the flames. So I'm going to also, let's take a look at spawning maybe just a few more particles. So we'll expand spawn, rate, and take that float constant. Let's kick that up to 45. And now you can really see some shimmer coming off the top of those flames. So now we've added two more effects to our particle system pretty quickly, actually. We've got a flame glow and we've got a heat shimmer. That's where we're going to go ahead and call it for now, though. So let's close up Cascade. Let's make sure we save our particle demo package. And that will wrap up this video. The last thing our particle system needs is a little bit of smoke. Now, we could just take one of our existing emitters, duplicate it, change out some modules, adjust some settings, and voila, we would have smoke. But I'm going to create a new one from scratch. It's just good practice.
So we'll right click, choose new particle sprite emitter. Now this time I did not have a material selected beforehand, so I get the ever so lovely default material. Now we need to change that. So before we do anything though, let's rename the emitter. I'll select it, right click, go to emitter, rename emitter, and let's call this smoke. Now I'm going to jump into the required module and we need the actual material we're going to use. So if I put cascade away, back here in the content browser we have m underscore smoke and I'll just go ahead and apply that. Now some of these settings are the same as what we use for the flame and glow emitters. So we're going to take interpolation method, set that to random, we're going to take sub images horizontal and vertical and set both of those to two. So now we're getting some little puffs of smoke. Moving down from here, I'm going to take the spawn rate and pull that back. So if we go down under distribution and it's float constant, we're going to set that down to 10. Let's switch down to the lifetime module. And currently this is a float uniform, which is good, but it's set to a min and a max of one. So let's set this to between 2.5 and 3.5, like so. Now moving down, we're going to take a look at our initial size. Now by default, this is set to uh, between 25 and 25. So let's take our max and we'll set X to 35. So we get a little bit of variation in our puffs of smoke, although they're kind of looking like bubbles right now. Now down from here, we have our initial velocity. Currently, I'm okay with the velocity that we have. Let me get the scaling system in place and then perhaps we'll reevaluate the velocity. But right now, I don't think that looks very bad. So next, we have our color over life module. And what I'm going to do with this is right-click it and delete it. It's gone. We're not going to use it. We're actually going to start off with an initial color, and then we're going to scale that initial color over the life of the particle. So I'm going to right-click, come down to color, and choose an initial color. And then right off the bat, this appears to be working okay. But let's go into its settings. And its start color currently has a distribution of vector constant. We're going to change that over to a constant curve. What this will allow us to do is change the color that these particles are going to have the moment they're born as the particle system exists. So each time the particle system cycles, it's going to grab another color from along the curve. So let's expand our curve. Currently it has no points, which is why you're seeing black. It's just kind of a, a uniform value of black. So let's add two points. And for the first point, we're going to leave the in value at zero and the out value at zero. So we're not even going to touch that point. Come over to point one and set the in value to one or the death of the particle. And we're going to set the out values to point fives down the board. So we're starting off at black and we're kind of shifting our way up toward gray. Now these are colors that are being assigned at the birth of the particle, so they're not going to change. It's just we're getting some variation along that curve. That's really how that works. Now, next we're going to scale that color across the life of the particle, which is going to solve two problems. One, it's going to allow us to change the color, which is pretty cool. But also, it's going to solve this newfound problem of the particles popping out of existence like little bubbles. So let's right click, come down to color, and we'll choose scale color over life. And we'll start off with the color scale over life property, which currently has a distribution with a vector constant curve. That's perfect. If we expand it, it has two points, also good. And here for our first point, we'll leave the in value at zero. And for the out value, we're actually going to start off. Actually, let's, you know, let's leave that at one. Come to think of it. And then for our second one, we're going to have an in value of 1 and an out value of 0. So we're actually making the color go toward black. We're starting off at birth with full color, and then we're scaling it back toward black as the particles continue to live on. And you can kind of see that here. The particles are darkening up. Now, against a black background, it looks like those particles are fading away nicely at this point. However, if we change the background color to anything other than black it becomes clear that the particles are still popping out of existence. So I'm going to set this back over to black because it just looks so much nicer. And we need to fix that problem. And we're going to do that by changing the alpha over life. 
So alpha scale over life as well. Now this also has a distribution, uh, but this time it's a distribution float constant, which is just a single value. So we're going to change that to a distribution float constant curve so that we can change the value over time. Now it has no points by default, which is why all of our smoke particles just seem to disappear. So let's add two points to this. And the first point specifies the birth of the particle by default. Let's set the out value up to one. And then the second one is almost finished for us. If we expand it, we'll take the in value, set it to one, which is the death of the particle, and out value will be set to zero. So literally, our particles are now fading away. Even if we change the background color, they're fading away nicely. Okay, let's set our background color back over to black. And we've got that taken care of. Now, moving down from here, we're having a little bit of an issue with these particles just being so tiny. So let's change that next. I'm going to right click and let's create a new size module. Let's grab a size by life. And here we have the life multiplier property within this. And this is already set to a distribution vector constant curve with two points such that the first point gives us full scale and the second point is the point at death that also gives us full scale. Well, that's, that could be better. So let's start with point one. Actually, you know what? Let's start with point zero, because what we're going to do with our in value of zero, which is the birth of the particle, we're going to take the out value and set that to zero. So these smoke particles are going to start off infinitely small. Then for point number one, we're going to take the in value and set it to 0.33, which is 33% of the particle's life. Take the out value, and we're going to crank this up to 2.5. So now our particles are seeming to grow. But that's not all. Actually, it looks a lot better already. But it's not entirely where I want to leave off. So let's go back up here to points, and I'll click the little green plus button to add a new item. Now that's going to break our scale for just a moment. Let's take our inval and set that to 1. And the out value we're going to set all the way up to 8. And now our particles will grow up to 2.5 times their scale over the first 33%, and they'll spend the rest of their lives scaling up to eight times their scale. And now we're starting to get some nice billowing smoke. Now, it would look a lot cooler if this smoke was rotating, so I'm going to right-click, come down to Rotation Rate, and we'll grab Initial Rote Rate. Let's step down inside its properties, and the float uniform is perfect, but we really need to slow this down and get some random values. So let's set this to negative 0.2 and positive 0.2 and now our smoke is nicely rotating. It's actually, it's looking pretty good. I can almost smell it at this point. Now let's see, is there anything else we really need to add? I guess a cylinder wouldn't run amiss, though technically these guys are starting off so faint that they're kind of working. Though we could just right click, come down to location, and drop in another cylinder. Now we need to change its settings like we did before. Once again, I'll go ahead and set up the draw 3D mode so we can see that cylinder. It just makes it easier to understand what it is we're doing. Let's take the start radius, and we'll pull that down to 5 to match our fire. Let's grab our start height, and we'll pull that. We could pull that down to 20. But then if we do that, let's offset the cylinder. We'll actually slide the whole thing up into the air. Grab the start location, expand its values, and we're going to set Z to 20. We'll just cause our smoke to be born from kind of a random area slightly above our flames. Now that looks like everything that I'd really like to add to the smoke. It's really working at this point. Let's go ahead and switch off the draw 3D mode on that cylinder. The last thing I want to do is turn off the grid and let's kind of zoom up to where we can see this pretty nicely. And I'm going to click the save thumbnail image button so that now when I close out of Cascade and take a look at our PS Fire, we actually have a picture of our fire. At this point, go ahead and save your package, and that's going to wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot. With your particle system complete, most of the work is now done. However, the last thing we need to do is get our particle system alive and working in our level. So what I'm going to do is, here inside of our little demo level that we've put together, I'm going to pick on some machine. Let's say this really weird liquid machine over here. We're going to light this thing on fire. Now to do this, let me jump into the content browser 
And here's our little PS Fire particle system. I'm going to slide the content browser kind of out of the way. We'll navigate right up here to the top of this thing, and I can just drag and drop, and we get the particle system. It really is that easy. So I can close out the content browser. If we switch over to real-time mode, you see that we have fire. In this case, our fire is pretty small, so don't be afraid to scale this up by using the draw scale fields down at the bottom of the screen in the console bar. If I set this up to three, we have three times as much fire. Now that's a whole lot of fire. Maybe we should pull that back down. Got a little bit ahead of myself. Now currently, you'll notice that I can't select your, uh, my fire, so make sure that you select right on the icon, or you can come up here and make sure that Allow Translucent Selection is active, and then you can actually click right on the flames themselves. So either way, just be aware of that setting. All right, now let's pull this down. Maybe 1.5. That's pretty good, but maybe a little more. I don't know. I, let's say 2. 2 will work. And we'll pull that down just a little bit. And if we deselect, it almost looks like there's some fire there. We're getting a nice ripple effect in the background, some cool stuff. But it's not complete, because with an effect like this, the particles are really only part of the whole solution. You need some lighting as well. So to keep things simple, what I'm going to do is just hold down the L key and drop down a new light. Now, if you really wanted to be hardcore about this, uh, you could create a light and animate it with uh, matinee so that it kind of flickered a little bit and the, the intensity of it went up and down. We're not going to go that far. But you could, and it would look pretty nice. Let's open up the properties of this light. Uh, let's see, let's go under light, light component. We'll start off with the point light component, and let's pull the radius back to, say, oh, I don't know, 722 big, maybe just 256. I think that'll work for now. And we'll come up to light component, take the brightness and kick that up to 2, and then take the light color, and we'll make this a nice bright shade of orange. In fact, it might kick that brightness up even more. There we go. So something kind of like so. That uh, might be too bright. So let's pull that back down to two. Just so we can still see our particles. Now, at this point, we would have lighting. We would have some particles. But even then, something would be missing. So what I'm going to do, even though we need to rebuild our lighting. If I come over here and get close to our fire, can you tell what's missing? We can't hear it you got to be able to hear fire. So let me go back into the content browser and let's search through all of our assets. I want you to search for fire small. And included with UDK, you've got a couple of sound effects that sound like fire. Now to me, these both sound pretty much alike. Just some nice flickering sound. Now with that selected, I'm going to right click here on the ground, choose add actor, and we'll just grab an ambient sound simple. And it really doesn't like to be moved. Isn't that great? We'll put that right in the middle of our fire and then open up its properties. And let's adjust its radii just a little bit. So underneath ambient properties, we've got our radius min and radius max. Let's set radius min to about 512 and our radius max to about 720, just for the sake of example. So now if we test out the level, We can hear the fire, and as we move away from it, the fire gets quieter. And you could tweak the overall radii and volume of that sound effect. You could also tweak your lighting and rebuild it. This is really just an example to show you that your particles alone will often not get the entire job done. So be ready to add in other elements like sound and lights as well. That is going to wrap things up for this video, though. Thanks a lot. Yeah.